Good morning. As been as we've been working our way through Hebrews chapters two, three, and four, um, we'll be in the series for another three weeks, I think, half till the twenty-third. Uh, the Israelites, we've discovered, developed heart problems in the wilderness, uh, hardened hearts. To a Jew, the heart isn't just the seat of emotion. To a Jew at that time, the heart is the seat of decision making. And the heart makes or breaks spiritual responsiveness. Hard heartedness means spiritual unresponsiveness. A heart that cannot make the decision that God would want to have the individual make. Entering God's rest, we've discovered, is the antidote for hard heartedness. We're going to talk about the particulars of entering God's rest in a seminar we're doing, it's in your worship folder, and we'll take the morning, September 23rd, to talk about rest and restlessness, and we'll look at the four steps that allow us to enter God's rest. And it's an important subject because as we've looked, here's what it says biblically, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. And what it describes then is the Israelites in the wilderness and saying, if you don't want to enter into the same problem that they entered into, then what you want to do is you want to enter that rest, make every effort to enter God's rest. Literally, it means rest and be quick about it. It means hurry up and rest. If you want to focus on doing something, you're wondering, okay, give me something to do. Here's what you do. You enter God's rest. And um, we're, look, why is God's rest necessary? And what we're seeing is restlessness is at the root of rebellion and bitter resentment and disbelief-based disobedience and unbelief. The writer of this letter provides another answer, kind of somewhat shocking. See if you can pick it up. I'm going to read this, follow along. See if you can pick up why should we Make every effort to enter God's rest. It gives one more reason. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by f- the same sort of disobedience for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning or judging the thoughts and attitudes intentions of the heart, and no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Why do we need to make every effort to enter God's rest? Surprisingly, because of the influence of the word of God. Because the word of God promotes restlessness. The word, when it says all things are naked, naked means naked, (laughs) and exposed. Exposed, you get one or two pictures. It's when you grasp, a wrestler grasps another wrestler by the neck in order to throw him. You can't put up a lot of resistance. If somebody has somebody in a choke hold, a neck hold, that person is very vulnerable. The neck is a very vulnerable place, and that's the image that it's creating, that The influence of the word of God is that it makes us feel in some way like that wrestler who is being grabbed by the neck and is in a very vulnerable position. Another image is the neck of a sacrificial victim, a lamb or a bull whose neck is elongated in order to receive a killing stroke from a sword to be naked and exposed then is to be put in a very precarious place. Um, It is to be overwhelmed by the fear of death. All are naked and exposed. And again, the impression is of total exposure and utter defenselessness in the presence of God and to his judgment. This is confusing. And if you hear what I'm saying, say, Mike, Todd, this doesn't sound good. No, it doesn't. Tell you what, if you're naked on a table and somebody has a sharp sword and they're telling you, just lean your neck back. Let me tell you what you're not going to do. 
You're not going to take a nap. You're not going to rest. There's nothing restful about that posture. And what we find then, at some level, the Word of God promotes restlessness. Uh, the image is, and again, it it's, has a sense of being strip searched. And again, if you're strip searched, you're not going to like it. We have the there's tendency to try to make this passage something other than it is. Um, but it doesn't work to put a nice face on it. The word of God being described at the time is the word of God that existed at the time. What word of God existed in the first century? Did the Old Testament exist? No, it did not. The, Old, the New Testament of the Bible didn't come to exist until the fourth century. There were letters being passed around, but they weren't put in a collection until the beginning of the fourth century. So what word of God is it talking about? It's talking about the books of the Old Testament and indicating that the word of God, that's the word of God, it produces restlessness. In the weeks to come, we're going to talk about Jesus and we'll talk about how the merciful, the merciful functioning of Jesus as a sympathetic high priest helps to us to deal with the unflinching judgment of all covenant law. But before we can appreciate Jesus' role as merciful high priest, we need to understand the problem that Jesus addresses. Jesus has to address the idea of spiritual confusion. There is not simply the word of God. There's not simply the word of God. There are the words of God. And they're very different. And their influence is very different. Talk about the words of God. Look what Jesus says. Matthew 23, Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So do and observe whatever they tell you. But not the works they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. Here, I don't think Jesus is objecting to the weight of the Pharisees' teachings. The Old Testament word for glory, when you, the Hebrew word translated glory in English is the Hebrew word kabod. Kabod. Here's what kabod, if you want a picture of kabod, here's, here's kabod. Something solid, something that doesn't move, something heavy then, something burdensome. That's the sense for the Hebrew word for glory is kabod, weighty, burdensome, big, it doesn't move. Um, the word of God then is something that brings a weight with it especially the Old Testament and Old Covenant, heavy and burdensome. It exerts a burdensome influence. Jesus' problem with the Pharisees is not that they place this load on people's shoulders, but they don't do anything to lift the load. That's the problem. That's the problem. See, God does impose spiritual burdens, but he doesn't leave the burden in place. He lifts the burden, and that's what we'll find is the role of the high priest and those who attend the high priest, especially Jesus. He lifts the load. Um, Jesus' problem, again, is that they did nothing to ease the load. He said they tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. The Old Testament word of God does indeed promote exposure, weariness, burden, and restlessness. The Old Testament, however, is not God's last word. It's what it says in John 1. John writes, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the word of God in the full and final sense. 
He expresses what God's voice is like. All other expressions of God's word are trumped by Jesus' arrival as God's word. The old word of God reflects law. The law came through Moses. That is not the clearest expression of God's voice. What we find, the new word of God, the one that Jesus comes and embodies, reflects grace and truth. Jesus is the word of God in a way the Old Testament is not. We're not throwing the Old Testament under the wheels, but we're saying it is what it is. And God's word accomplishes that purpose for which he sent it. Why does God send the Old Testament? To lift the load or to impose the load? The Old Testament exists to impose the load. Jesus as the word of God exists to lift it. That's the way it works. Listen to what Jesus says, Matthew 11, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus speaks to those who live under the weight of the word of God, the written word of God at the time. And Jesus' influence is in marked contrast. The Old Testament Hebrew word translated glory is kabod. It means something weighty, something that doesn't budge, doesn't move. The New Testament word translated glory has a very different picture. It's doxa. We heard the doxology, the word of praise. Doxa means glory or praise. Literally, it means an opinion, an opinion. It's the esteem a person has for another person. Here's the way you might see it. If somebody is, say you're, you're standing in the back, somebody you haven't seen for a long time, they come through the back door and you see them, and what happens when you see somebody that you maybe weren't expecting to see, what do they say about your face? Your face lights up. And because of the light in your face, it says something about your relationship with that person. Your face lights up. And that's the sense for doxa. Kabod has the sense of evaluation, judgment, burden, doxa has the idea not of evaluation, but valuation, esteem. It's the image of knowing that you matter. That's the sense for the New Testament word for glory. Would you agree with me? These are very different pictures, very different images of glory. Uh, and Jesus comes then to bring the latter. Kabod promotes restlessness. And doxa promotes rest. Do you see the problem? There's two words of God. There's two words of God. One word produces weariness, burden, and restlessness. The other word produces rest. Which word is God's word? In a final sense. Which voice is the voice of God? Um, what it says, Paul talks about a spiritual journey and let's see what Paul says in Romans chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. Paul writes, I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness, 
for apart from the law, sin is dead. Paul talks again about his spiritual journey, and Paul's battle with coveting began when he was exposed to the command, do not covet. And what he says, sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness, for apart from law, sin lies dead. What Paul found is that old covenant law stimulate, stimulated the very behaviors it prohibited. I want you to listen to me. This might sound confusing, but it's fairly straightforward. It's very surprising. What Paul found out, when he came under the awareness that the Bible said, do not covet, did that awareness increase his coveting or decrease it? What is he saying? Increase. Do you hear what that's saying? We need, to, we need to see this. What Paul found out, old covenant law stimulated the very behaviors it prohibited. It didn't make it easier not to covet. It made it more difficult not to covet. Impossible. In fact, if you're going to try to control coveting, in order to, be in order to not be blown up by God, if you're going to try to control coveting, in order to not be blown up by God, you will covet more. You can't control it. It's like trying to control a sneeze or a cough. You ever try that? You... <laughs> that's, what, that's what happens, but it's not coughing, it's coveting. By the way, just so we can be clear about this, do you break the commandments? Coveting is a sin. Coveting is a sin. Let me tell you what coveting means. Wanting what somebody else has. Wanting the life somebody else has. The wife somebody else has. Wanting what someone else has. That's coveting and that's prohibited by the Ten Commandments. Try to control that. Give it a try. Try to control your desire when you see someone has something that you want or they're functioning in a way you don't want them to function and you want to function. Try to control that coveting. <coughs> That's what's going to happen. If you're honest with yourself. If you're honest with yourself. Some of us... We said, no, that's not me, and we push it under the surface. That's called hypocrisy. That's not me. I don't do that. Or some of us don't do this. We do this. Judgment. You know what hypocrisy and judgment are attempts to do? Try to not face the fact that we have a hard time keeping the commandments. And this is what Paul came to understand. Paul found out that... The law of God on the heart promoted a restless battle of desires. And again, just so we can be clear, in order to break the commandments, you don't need to kill somebody. All you need to do is be angry at them. Because that's coveting. And in order to break the commandments, you don't need to commit adultery. All you need to do is lust. And you've already committed adultery in your heart. So you're saying, Mike, Mike, what are you doing? Do you feel the weight? Do you feel the weight? I hope so. Because if you don't feel the restlessness, you're not going to be motivated to enter the rest. That's what God, God imposes restlessness in order to move us into his rest. Um, what Paul found, though, is before he found the solution, he was face to face with the problem. Look what he says in Romans 7, 21 through 25. <clears throat> so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. But I see in my members another law, waging war against the law of my mind, 
and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Do you see what he's saying here? He runs by two different different sets of desires. This is Paul now. This is not a spiritual flunky. He finds that there's a place that wants to do what God wants, but he finds another set of desires that doesn't want to do what God wants. And the, the sin that Paul is wrestling with here, do not covet. I don't want to 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 covet. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, I do. No, you're... He seems schizophrenic. Spiritually schizophrenic. That's, our, that's what we deal with. That's what we deal with, and that's why we become restless. Rather than admit what Paul admits, we're like the scarecrow and the Wizard of Oz. What do you want to do? Which direction do you want to go? This way looks good. I want to do what God wants, and I don't. That's what Paul comes to. And the more he tried to do what God wants in order not to get blown up by God, the worse the problem became. Anybody understand this? Anybody ever feel anything like this? Sometimes we don't because we don't include the sin of coveting. I I don't do that. I didn't do that. I've never had an affair. I've never done that. But it's, it's about desires. It's about desires. Um, Paul goes on, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Paul is being incarcerated or imprisoned by the sin of coveting. What was his coveting about? You know what I bet you? And I don't know. I have this sneaking suspicion that when Paul was knocked off his donkey and onto his I think he was fully motivated to do what God wanted him to do. I, I think he was wholehearted. And then he continued to obey God. And then he went to Philippi and was mistreated. And Thessalonica and was mistreated. And you know what started to happen to Paul? What he became aware of? When it was time for him to make the journey and enter another city where he was going to do miracles and heal people, and they were going to turn on him, and they were going to send him out of the city on a stretcher. And he experienced that again and again. Here's, I think, what could have happened. He found himself, I don't want to go. I don't want to enter this city. I don't want to be beaten up again. That's coveting. I don't want to do what God wants me to do. That's coveting. What am I? I got to try hard. I, I got to, it's okay. I'm not, I'm not in that much pain. And he couldn't control it. I'm coveting. I'm coveting. What am I going to do? And he couldn't control it. That's the sin that he couldn't control. He comes to God perceiving this split in himself, perceiving what he says, I see in my mind, my members, another law, waging war against the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Paul's indwelt by two different desires. There's the law of God in his mind and the law of sin in his members. They end up fighting. Who wins? Does the law of God incarcerate the law of sin or does the law of sin incarcerate the law of God? Which one is it, the former or the latter? You know, you know who ends up winning? The law of sin at work within his members. That's what ends. And Paul comes to God and says, I can't do it. You've saved me, and I, I can't control coveting. And he com- becomes honest. And this is the most expressive Prior to this time, the most revealing self-portrait I think we have. He is being incredibly authentic and vulnerable here. 
exposing something that people are going to say, yeah, the problem is you're not strong enough. But he just tells the truth. He cries out to God. And this is what he says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Jesus comes up and does something. Okay. And let's find out what happens. So I want you to look in verse 23 on the front side of what Jesus does, okay? Verse 23, the front side of Jesus, and let's compare the front side and then the, the far side of this salvation. Do you understand? Let's, let's, let's find out what Jesus did. Okay, the front side of salvation. I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members, okay? On the front side, law of God in the mind, law of sin in the members. Would you agree? Okay, now let's look in verse 25. Let's see. Now Jesus has done what Jesus does. On the far side, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. Law of God with the mind, law of Sin with the flesh or the members. Do you see anything different between those two descriptions? Do you understand what I'm saying? On the front side, there's two different laws. On the far side, it seems to be the same thing. Would you agree? You know what this is something like? It's like going to Avera with Sanford Hospital. Go there with heart disease and skin cancer. And... They treat you, and then somebody says, how did it go? You know, you had the heart disease and skin cancer. He said, oh, <laughs> thanks be to God. I was really in a tough place. You know, I, I went in there with skin cancer and heart disease, and I came out, and, and now I have skin cancer and heart disease. <laughs> how much did you pay for that? I mean, what doctor did you see? Remind me not to go to that doctor. That sounds a lot like what Paul is saying. What is the salvation that Jesus brings? What was the salvation? There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Here's what, here's what happens. Paul comes and he understands that he can't beat coveting. He can't beat it. He comes to God, says, I can't do it. And you know what the voice of God says to him? I do not condemn you. I am not, wait a minute. I am breaking the, I am not condemning you. Wait, I'm breaking the, I am not condemning you. 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 I know what you're struggling with. I know you want to do what I want and part of you doesn't. And I am not condemning you. Hmm. Do you know what we find in verse 23? Restlessness. What do we find in verse 25? What do we find? What do we find? Rest. Rest. I think this is where Paul learned to enter God's rest. The voice of God, I'm not condemning you. I think this is where Paul learned to enter God's rest. God's rest isn't the absence of internal conflict. I want you to listen to me. God's rest isn't the absence of internal conflict. It's the absence of eternal condemnation. That's what rest is. That's what rest is. In entering God's rest, we don't exit our restlessness. In entering God's rest, we don't exit our restlessness. We don't control our restlessness. When we enter God's rest, it's not about our restlessness. It's about his rest. We enter God's rest. Paul learned to enter God's rest 
when he began to understand that his own sin didn't disturb God's rest. I want you to listen to me. Paul learned to enter God's rest when he began to understand that his sin didn't disturb God's rest. His coveting didn't disturb God's rest. God wasn't there going, oh, okay, great, wonderful. There's my apostle to the Gentiles, all tied up in himself. Boy, Jesus, what are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do. Restless. God, God sees Paul struggling, and his, it doesn't disturb his rest. Your struggle doesn't disturb God's rest. But you said, but Mike, you don't know. Your struggle doesn't disturb God's rest. At some point, it all comes back to coveting. Your coveting doesn't disturb his rest. What would happen if we believed that? We would learn to enter God's rest. That's what would happen. And in learning to enter God's rest, you know what you would find? Your hard-heartedness would begin to, our hard-heartedness would begin to dissipate. Something softer would begin to take its place. We would find ourselves being more open and honest and authentic with God. We wouldn't push things down inside. We would take them out and bring them to the one who we can bring them to. God, I've got these thoughts and feelings, and I don't like it. Some people seem to reach into their heart and bring out all kinds of good stuff. Honestly, though, we reach into our heart, and we're going to bring out a steaming pile. You know, there's some things in there that's not, that aren't really that good. And what, what, what we do is learn to bring them and speak <coughs> openly and honestly to him and understand that the reason why we can do so is that God's at rest. He's not going to jump off his throne. That's what Paul learned. That's what Paul learned. Um, Paul learned to enter God's rest when he was drowned in coveting. Um, we cannot enter God's rest. Just so you know, if you're going to wait to enter God's rest until you're sinless, you will never do it. You will not do it. If you're going to try to enter, wait to enter God's rest until you defeat the sin, forget it. Because the commandments of God stimulate the very behaviors they prohibit. So if you're going to try to master it, you're not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. We have to enter God's rest as we are. You don't need to go any more, you don't need to be any more devoted than you are right now to enter God's rest. You just need to f focus on where he is. And he says, as part of the new covenant, I will be helios to their unrighteousnesses and remember their sins no more. That's what we're going to experience with communion. That's what communion is about, a new covenant. A new covenant. The Old Testament figures the Old Covenant, and it's burdensome. The New Testament features the New Covenant, and as Jesus indicated, it doesn't promote restlessness, it promotes rest. It's kind of hard for us. Again, we have different voices. Some of us are so used to hearing the voice of God that we've lost touch with the voice of God. The voice of God says, don't just sit there, do something. Don't just sit there, do something. The voice of God says, don't just do something, sit there. Better still, don't just do something, come and join me in the place where I sit. <coughs> Enter my rest. And what you'll find is that rebellion and hard-heartedness and disbelief-based disobedience and unbelief will slowly begin to dissipate, and rest starts the moment you learn. Again, we're going to talk more specifically about how to enter rest. Some of you are saying, uh, you know what, isn't this a little dangerous? You know what I mean? I mean, if I believed all that, and if I entered God's rest, what would keep me from doing all the wrong things that I want to do? Interestingly, what it says, resting 
won't lead to self-centered rebellion. It will lead in the opposite direction. That's what we're. In fact, not resting leads to rebellion, and disbelief, and sin. Resting, enter God's rest, leads in the other direction. Um, that's why it says, "Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by following the same sort of disobedience." There is a new covenant, and we'll continue to talk about it because, as we understand, that God is not restless. And that's really what the table is about. As you take the bread and the juice, what it's there to express, Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood. And what he tells us and asks us to remember as we take the elements, the new covenant has overridden the old one. The God's current operating system is the new covenant where he forgives his helios to your own righteousness remember your sin no more what i want you to do is you take the elements think about that think about god being aware of you the things you struggle with and being at rest and think about entering that rest Father, thank you for the words that you speak. And in your knowledge and wisdom, you've determined that would be successive words that have very different impacts. There would be a foundation of a word that creates restlessness and burden. And a subsequent word that would be championed by God in human form who would announce a different word, a new covenant word that would bring rest. And that rest is not an escape. It's not a justification. It's not an excuse. It's not giving up. It's not not trying hard. It's an entrance into the place that you live. Rest is more the place you live than something you give. You would invite us to enter into your rest into your presence and there experience power. Pray that you would help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.